Do injuries in the Cardinals outfield mean an opening for Victor Scott II on opening day? And is the top prospect ready to fill that opening without risking his development? Coming up on B-Shafe Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you on Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Talking a little Cardinals baseball. Been a couple of days since we've gotten behind the mic, but we're back and ready to discuss an interesting topic that is becoming a discussion point on social media. And it involves a name that Cardinals fans, if they don't know it yet, which I, I think a lot of folks do at this point, they're going to learn much more about this player in the weeks and perhaps months ahead with the possibility that Victor Scott the second outfield prospect for the St. Louis Cardinals could crack this opening day roster as a result of the injuries to the projected starting outfield. We don't really know what the status is for Tommy Edmond, how long the setback with his wrist is going to keep him out of action. If it's going to bleed into the regular season, that's my expectation based on everything we've heard about his timeline. And it's just the unknown of it, right? When there's not really a concrete injury to say, yep, this is what it is, and this is the timeline for it. They're on the back side of this thing after a surgery. He's recovering and trying to strengthen back up and dealing with inflammation and and, and the wrist just not responding to the level of activity that is required of Tommy Edmond when he does his role as the center fielder for the St. Louis Cardinals and in the batter's box, etc. So because of that sort of uncertainty, I just don't know when Tommy Edmond is going to be back. I mentioned it when the sort of setback for him was first reported alongside. It was like within a day or two of the hamstring news for Sonny Gray. And at the time I said, I think if everything goes well for Edmond on this ramp up, he'll be back first. But I also think that if you were to ask me who's at further risk of being out come May or June, from the current injury, it's undoubtedly Edmund. I said that at the time because we don't know. It's just a matter of when the program that he's on can be conducive to the the strengthening process without dealing with inflammation, without dealing with discomfort, et cetera. Sonny Gray seemed to be a pretty cut-and-dry injury, and lo and behold, we're getting good news now on Sonny Gray. He's been on the mound for days. He's been throwing for days. And probably Thursday, I record this on Wednesday, Thursday could be the next time we see him throw a more intense bullpen. I'm I'm getting that info from John Denton of MLB.com, his story on MLB.com from a couple of days ago. At the time, he said it could be Wednesday or Thursday that Sonny Gray throws a more intense bullpen than the last one that he threw, which was like 20 innings, (laughs) 20 innings, 20 pitches, 20 innings would be notable. Uh, Yeah, he just a light 20 inning bullpen, nothing too serious (laughs) coming off the hamstring. No, he threw 20 pitches, and then the word was he was looking to get to maybe a little more intensity and rigor with his bullpen, which I joked, I don't really know that Sonny Gray knows how to go half speed in a bullpen. He's he's all gas all the time, which is a great quality. But the idea being that over maybe a a longer stretch, 35-40 pitches rather than the 20, would be a bullpen session that we'd see either today, which is Wednesday, or tomorrow, Thursday, And I've already seen a tweet from Lynn Worthy of the Post-Dispatch talking about the activity that Sonny Gray did. He played catch. He worked and did some some work on on the mound without a ball in his hands. So that tells me maybe tomorrow would be the plan for the bullpen as long as everything is still on schedule there. But yeah, I I just felt like that was going to be a situation that we, we knew was contained within sort of the process that he had gone through previously in 2022, having hamstring issues. And right now, things seem to be really good for Sonny Gray. Uh, Thursday, uh, according to Gray himself, was the one that, uh, and again, not specifically Thursday, but there was the idea that he would throw within the next couple few days, and it seems like tomorrow, Thursday, could be the day that that happens um, based on the fact that it did not happen today. But at the time, Sonny said, that next bullpen, or I'd ramp up the rigor a little more, that one's going to be the one that tells the story and tells more about the timeline for him. So if you go 40 pitches and it goes great, then you could potentially see him in a Grapefruit League game. I wouldn't be surprised if that was, you know, four or five days later, whatever the schedule would would detail, maybe three days later, because pitchers do throw bullpens in between their their five-day, 
start schedule. So could be really good news for Sonny Gray. And then we'll talk about once that kind of comes down, whether we think opening day is a possibility for him. It's still, it seems like it's on the table. I think there's a whole podcast to be done just talking about whether it's worth the risk to kind of push him. You know, if you think he's good to go, but you know you need him for the long run, it's a topic that I talked with uh, my co-host on the big show on KTGR about yesterday, Andy Humphrey. We went back and forth like, yeah, it makes sense that if he's healthy, he might as well be out there, but is there any way to cost him down the road by trying to rush him back too quickly and kind of batting that back and forth as a thought process? And my take is, man, if you can get a win, even if it's just an optics win to have him back on opening day when it didn't seem like it would be very likely at one point in time, that would be really worthwhile, but also not at the expense or the extent of of maybe it could cause him some issues down the road if they're not extremely, extremely cautious. So an interesting thought there. Let me know in the comments below, too, if you have thoughts on uh, what we've been hearing about Sonny Gray's development, and we might um, do our next podcast on him if there's no major news to break. But I bring him up because I did say at the time, I thought Tommy Edmonds' injury in terms of the long run, if there was a risk for it to go south on a guy, I thought Edmund would be at higher risk of that. And it seems like we're in that stage right now, although if a couple good weeks happen for him, maybe, you know, mid-April still a possibility. I would be stunned if Edmund's on the open day roster um, unless there's an update real, real soon about how great everything's going for him. I, it just doesn't seem plausible. And then there's Lars Newpar's ribs, which is a weird thing because... You know, it's kind of a pain tolerance thing. It's kind of going to heal on its own, but you don't want to rush him back too quickly either uh, from the, the cracked ribs if, if you know, another collision or whatever happens and then you, you're you in a worse spot than you would have been. Like, they got to be careful with that. But they did say, as of the day they talked about his injury, the Cardinals did, that they were hopeful for opening day, which would have been about three weeks to the day from when he sustained the injury, which is kind of a, or, or maybe not even three weeks, but kind of one of those deals where, be really nice to have him, but if you can ensure his longevity by keeping him out for a couple of weeks in April, then that's probably the way that you want to go. But where that leads us to today, Cardinals fans, is thinking about the opening day roster and what that's going to look like for the St. Louis Cardinals. Not only the opening day roster, but the opening day lineup as well. And left field would have been Lars Newpar's spot. We know that Tommy Edmond would have been in center field. So here we are. On the 13th of March, just a day more than two weeks away from the open of the regular season, and the Cardinals are basically down two starting outfielders. Now, this could end up going just fine. Looking at the Cardinals' spring training stats before their game on Wednesday, because I'm recording this Wednesday morning, and we have seen a lineup for the Cardinals, and we will talk about it in the context of Victor Scott. But first, I'll touch on the left field spot. It very clearly seems to me that you're going to want Alec Burleson in your lineup against right-handed pitching to begin the season when you, if you don't have Newbar and you don't have Edmund. Alec Burleson is having a really nice spring. 11 for 27, a 407 batting average. I believe that leads the team this spring. Of the guys who have played, like, at least considerable playing time, more than 10 at-bats, say, um, that's pretty high up there. Cesar Prieto has shown the hit tool. He's hitting 409 in 22 at-bats. Lars Newbar only had nine at-bats. Um, Jacob Buckberger only had three at-bats. So basically, for, for for the guys that are playing a decent amount, Prieto is at 409, Burleson at 407, um, Burleson at 484 on the on-base percentage. Again, basically high on the team for anybody with at least 10 at-bats. And he's slugging a little bit too. Um, taking his walks, has one home run, has a double. Again, it's a very small sample size, 11 games, 27 at-bats, 30-some-odd plate appearances. But his OPS is 1040, uh, north of 1,000. Again, of the players that have played meaningful opportunity, he's leading the team in OPS. Matt Carpenter, 12 at-bats, has a, an OPS north of 1,000. That's good to see. And Thomas Sejaci, I've been beating the drum for him. Even before the Brandon Crawford thing, I thought, man, Sejaci, if they could just put him at shortstop a little bit, they might find out that he's their guy. Um, they, they've got Crawford for that kind of uh, that coverage. But if I, I would say that if, man, Sejaci starts in AAA and he's, I would put him at shortstop a lot. And I would see what it looks like there. He's got a 971 OPS this spring, 379 average. He's uh, he's 11 for 29, a couple of doubles, has a homer, nine RBIs. I think that leads the team. So, so JC has looked really, really good, which I expected. Um, I would wonder if you get into May, June, and so JC's tearing it up, 
whether they would make a move there. I, you don't want to dispense Brandon Crawford because he's really there to be that coverage at backup shortstop. But it would be interesting. Like, would they consider if Crawford wasn't providing a ton of punch, which maybe he will, you know, it's very early in his opportunity that he's seen in games to make that determination. But would it would it be something that where the Cardinals could find enough plate appearances for Sajasi, a little bit at shortstop to cover a win, a little bit at second base, third base? Would they be willing to do that if the bat was tearing it up in AAA? Sajasi's going to start the season, we figure, in AAA, but man, could really have an opportunity at that point um, if he shows well. And and I I would love what the flexibility for him would be to play shortstop if he would be able to handle that. Cardinal prospect Thomas and JC. But let's talk about the other Cardinal prospect. So like for me, Burleson and left. I know you'll kind of have to figure out what to do as well with Donovan. Um, it, it could be as simple as, yeah, Burleson's still just a bat off the bench, even against righties, because Donovan's going to play left. Gorman's going to be uh, your second baseman. But there is the DH to play with, too. So my view on this is between those three spots, DH, second base, left field, you're going to have Burleson, Donovan, Gorman on a given day against right-handed pitching. And... However you line that up, I think is fine. Gorman can either be the DH or be the second baseman. Donovan can either be the DH, second baseman, or left fielder. He could do all three. Uh, Burleson could play left or could DH. And I just think those are going to be the three guys in those spots against right-handed pitching. So you stack some lefties in there. You've got, obviously, righties. Contreras is going to be a mainstay. Arenado, Goldsmith going to be a mainstay. Jordan Walker going to be a mainstay. They have a lot of very solid balance to that lineup, which would have been the case if Lars Newpar was out there um, instead of Burleson or whatever. I, I still think it's going to be a nice balance to the lineup, but if Burleson is hitting, man, they, that would be really a nice sign because they internally really liked him last year. He hit into some bad luck. The numbers weren't overwhelmingly good. I think like an 87 OPS plus, so below league average, but a really good contact-oriented hitter that has put the work in this offseason. His body looks different. He's leaner. Um, he, he did that in order to not only just be you know, a better more agile overall, but specific to his ability to handle the outfield. Um, and so we, we kind of see what that ends up looking like. I wouldn't be surprised, though, to see if he's your DH and it's it's Gorman at second and Donovan in left as Donovan starts to work into more outfield opportunities. That's the word for him this coming week or two is that we'll see more of that. I think you probably would grade Donovan as a better defensive player in left than Burleson, um, even though Donovan more of an infielder. But he's shown the ability to do it all. He won a utility goal glove for a reason. But that's kind of the way I look at it with those three spots. But then there's a center field spot. And we kind of figured, hey, Dylan Carlson's the guy that's obviously going to fill that role. But as you have watched spring unfold, he has not necessarily taken the bull by the horns and made that his, right, with the numbers at, at the plate, especially against right-handed pitching. That's going to be the way that the Cardinals, I think, have to view it because it's predominantly what you're going to see. And I have said on this podcast going back to last year, when it was hashtag everyday Dylan, I'd love nothing more than to see him seize an opportunity. But at a certain point, you do have to take ownership of that and do it without it just being handed to you, especially in the case of other players behind you at the similar positions pushing the door and trying to wedge an opening that they could slide through. Right now, as of this recording on Wednesday morning, uh, Dylan Carlson is hitting 208 with a 240 on base and a 250 slug, which is a 490 OPS in 25 uh, spring training plate appearances. He has a double, three RBIs on a stolen base uh, with one walk, seven strikeouts. So not a ton. And this wouldn't be, these wouldn't be numbers that would be disqualifying for Dylan, for, for, for a lot of players, right? Uh, from having their starting job if they were sort of an incumbent. But Dylan's kind of on that tweener line where he, on paper, was the fourth outfielder coming into the season because they, at least with the way that they were forming this in their words and their actions, um, we're going to have Tommy Edmond be the everyday center fielder with Carlson floating around to all three outfield spots, still getting plenty of opportunity on paper. That was going to be the way it would go, but you know, not having ownership of that center field spot. Then with Edmonds injury, it's like, okay, it's going to be Carlson, right? It's just, he's the obvious answer. And maybe Michael Ciani, who is on the 40 man roster can play center field as well. He'll be on the bench as sort of backup center fielder. And he'll get some opportunity to, as the fourth outfielder, the same that Dylan would have had. Um, had had Edmund uh, not been injured. And in that land, Alec Burleson would have been in Memphis. But now Alec Burleson's going to be able to play left field. He's going to be on the team, and he's actually hitting really well, so that's good news. And you're looking at it from a, a little bit of a different lens when it comes to Dylan Carlson because there is somebody pushing. 
in center field, Dylan Carlson, and that's Victor Scott the second. And that's who we teased we were going to talk about. We're going to talk about him right now. Um, but there was a lot of sort of background that I wanted to get to before diving in on, on Victor Scott. I mentioned the numbers for Dylan Carlson, a sub-500 OPS as of right now. Victor Scott's OPS is up to 913. He's hitting 370 with a 469 on base. So the fact that this guy, who stole 94 bases last year, is also taking his walks is really something impressive. And, you know, no home runs, but he does have a triple. His speed is is tremendous, and he's 10 for 27. Um, he's the type of guy that if his on-base percentage is higher than his slugging percentage, it's maybe not the end of the world when the, the numbers are so high. 469 on base, 444 slug for a 913 OPS. Victor Scott is doing everything right now in his power to sort of beat the door down and say, hey, Cardinals, I know that historically – I am a lot of the things that don't get you on the opening day roster. I haven't played in AAA. I'm not on the 40-man roster. So there are complications to it that would cause the Cardinals to say, you know what, it's easier, it's simpler, it's more comfortable to send Victor Scott to, 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 to Memphis, to AAA, and get him a little bit more seasoning. But man, he is an exciting player that, for me, and I've said this on Twitter, so anybody listening to this that follows me at bshafer12 on Twitter shouldn't be surprised to hear me say it. But for me, it would be an open and shut case. I've seen enough. Victor Scott is on my opening day roster, and he is my starting center fielder on opening day, March 28th in Los Angeles. He's batting ninth, but he's in that lineup with what I believe that he can bring, first and foremost, defensively, which is exactly the reason Tommy Edmond was prescribed to be the everyday center fielder. Victor Scott has insane speed to burn. He's got really good instincts in center, athletic, and is going to be able to track down a lot of those fly balls in the gap, a lot of those balls that might drop in front of another another player. I think he's going to have the sort of captaincy mentality of the outfield. Like, I'm the, I'm the quarterback of this outfield, and I'm, it's my responsibility to go and track down these balls and save outs and save runs for my pitchers. I think that's what Victor Scott the second can bring defensively. Obviously, offensively is the other side of this. And I made the comment on Twitter, kind of going back and forth with some different people, that I think whatever he would bring at this point offensively is gravy. Because you look at what the Cardinals are doing with Mason Wynn, who is a player a couple of years, Victor Scott's junior. Mason Wynn's just 21 years old. Now he is about to turn 22 before opening day. But Victor Scott is already 23 years old. And we're not really batting an eye that Mason Wynn's going to be the everyday shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinals to start the season, despite the fact that he hit 172 with a 467 OPS in 137 plate appearances last season, which is not like a small sample size. It is a small sample size in the context of like a full season, but it's not like it's more than a cup of coffee. It's more than guy gets 50 PAs and you try to, to draw a conclusion from that. It was a decent amount of run that the Cardinals gave him at the end of last year, and I think it was 100% right. You allowed him to play through all of it. You play through kind of the growing pains and the struggles of, of being at a new level for the first time, not only a new level, but the highest new level that there is to go through. And in a, in a season that was lost, that was something that the Cardinals indisputably gained, was to give Mason Wynn that run regardless of his performance so that he could feel what that would, would be like. Now this season is one that counts, and I think Mason Wynn is up to the task. And if we're, you know, comparing him to Victor Scott II directly is not super fair, but we're always going to draw comparisons when it comes to players and their development and, and certain checkpoints that are reached and stages that are reached to try and say, hey, can we ascertain when this guy's going to be ready for the big leagues? Because it could kind of mirror what this guy did and the trajectory that he took in the same organization at a similar pace, a similar age, et cetera. Um, it's always going to be a little bit different because Mason Wynn was drafted by the Cardinals out of high school. And so he's been playing professional baseball compared to Victor Scott, who was a, a collegiate draftee and then has less professional experience coming into this spring camp. Mason Wynn had nearly 500 plate appearances at, at AAA Memphis last year. Uh, Victor Scott has none. So, again, we I can totally acknowledge that there are vast differences in the way that, that you're going to approach a situation from one player to the next. But there is an element that I would compare the two, and that's just in, like, the way – both guys carry themselves. I feel like Victor Scott is a guy with a good head on his shoulders, has the ability to sort of work through, at least is my perception, 
some of the things that he might go through at the big league level, even if offensively he has a little bit of what Mason Wynn had this past season, a little bit of a slow start offensively. It could go that way for Victor Scott if the Cardinals call him up right away. And uh, Kyle Reese, who's great on on prospect conversations, uh, chimed in on Twitter, and, and, and he seems to be leaning. I haven't talked to him outside of the tweets you might see, but he seems to be leaning toward the side of, be careful with the development of a player like Victor Scott II who hasn't yet reached AAA Memphis, right? He hasn't had that experience, and you'd be jumping from A to the big leagues, which is what Jordan Walker did last year. But again, I think everybody was sort of on board with Jordan Walker being, I don't know if I want to use the word like generational when it comes to a hitting prospect, but he was very, very advanced for his age, for the levels that he had reached um, compared to most players that are at, at a similar caliber in their career. So that's not a direct comparison that I want to make either to Victor Scott because you want to kind of keep everything within its proper context. But that would be sort of the thought process is, yeah, are the underlying metrics and the things that are showing Victor Scott to be having success right now uh, uh, enough? Are they are you confident in what that looks like, that he could go to the big leagues and not completely be overwhelmed and overmatched? And I think it is important to see through the rest of spring training. Like if he does go over the rest of spring training, he's taken a lot of strikeouts and it doesn't look the way that it's looked so far, you might have a different perception of like, man, we could bring this guy up and in April he could be floundering and that could really hinder his development uh, and his confidence level. And that's certainly a possibility, but I like to kind of bring up that that could be a possibility for any player. Right. And, and Kyle did bring up Dylan Carlson and, and kind of showing the the sort of risk of, hey, when a guy's ready, how do you know he's ready? When you bring him up, what do you get from him? How do you kind of cater to his development, even at the big league level? Like, that's a lot of what Dylan Carlson's been going through a little bit. And I do think at this point in his career, even though he is so young, I question whether he has that same confidence that he came up with. And that's, you know, something that I think could be a point toward, hey, don't rush a guy to the big leagues. But there also is the element of like Dylan Carlson like had the 2020 thing that was weird because of COVID and he was up and then back to the camp or whatever. But then his next season, his real true rookie season, Dylan Carlson had really good numbers. It's really the stuff that's happened since then. You know, his ability or inability to adjust back to the league and the adjustments that they made to him within the confines of the opportunity that the Cardinals have given Carlson, right? Like that came at a little bit of an awkward time where, he struggles a little bit, has some injuries, and then there are other guys waiting to sort of take his opportunity, and the Cardinals were not as as gracious or generous with giving the the rope, the healthy leash to Carlson and say, well, hey, he had the one really solid season. Let's continue to push. And look, I'm not going to go back through the game logs, and, and we can – we're just kind of going on feel a little bit with this, right, which is not entirely maybe fair to the Cardinals because – they could look at it and say, well, Harrison Bader was playing well, or this happened or that happened, and we had this guy to fit in there. And I know there's always a reason, and it just felt like Dylan, for a few too many times, was sort of the odd man out on some of those reasons. And then what were the ramifications on his confidence from that? So I totally get where where Kyle is coming from with that because he said, well, look, Dylan Carlson was a guy who you would have said coming out, great head on his shoulders, it's going to be fine. And now – you know, at least I'll speak for myself, I feel a little bit differently about what I've seen from Carlson. I would love to see him just have that killer instinct, show it, I think it's in there, but show it regardless of what the Cardinals give him in terms of opportunity and try and overcome that. It's not going to be easy, but that's something that I still think is within within him to do and potentially do this season, even in the event that Victor Scott the second maybe gets the opening day nod and Carlson is sort of back to a, a roving role within the team or more of a platoon role where I actually think for the benefit of the Cardinals, maybe not for the benefit of longevity of, of Dylan Carlson's you know, career or, or career earnings, ability to prove himself as an everyday player, like that opportunity may not be uh, super robust for Carlson this year unless he sort of kicks it up and, and, and takes it. But I look at a world where here's what I was going to say about the lineup for Wednesday. Again, I'm recording this before Wednesday's game. I'll talk about what Victor Scott did. Um, yesterday, and, and he's had a couple of games like this where he's just been really, really um, compelling. But to start the game on Wednesday is going to be Victor Scott the second in center field leading off, Dylan Carlson batting second in left field. So this is kind of something that if the Cardinals were really thinking about, hey, what would this look like to have Victor Scott on the on the opening day roster? And I don't know for sure who the opposing pitcher is today that the Cardinals are facing. I probably should have known that. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. They're going to they're gonna give Carlson opportunities in spring regardless. But when you look at it against lefties in particular, 
the guys that are vying for left field opportunities, Burleson, Donovan, and then Gorman, who fits into that kind of triangle between second base, left field, DH on a given day, um, unless you have somebody else that's just a uh, Jordan Walker is in there or a, a corner infielder like Goldie or Orinato is in there for a rest day, whatever. Generally, you're going to see those opportunities kind of float in that direction. And even then, when it's a corner infielder, like Donovan can play first. Gorman can play third. Like those guys are finding their way into the lineup anyway. But what I think is interesting against left-handed pitching, though everybody that we talked about, those three, Donovan, Gorman, and Burleson are all left-handed hitters. And Burleson may be the guy you platoon Carlson with. And Carlson is your left fielder against left-handed pitching. Again, this is while Newt Barr is out. This is while Tommy Edmond is out. We don't know what the length of time is going to be on that. But that's kind of an interesting nugget from the lineup on Wednesday where the Cardinals... They've got them both in the lineup, and Victor Scott is is center field. And I think that makes sense because I think his upside in center field, as much as I think Dylan can do the job, I think Victor Scott has higher upside than anybody in the organization, Tommy Edmond included, defensively in center field. Because I think you could talk about similar athleticism, similar speed, although Victor Scott's probably faster. And you could talk about the arm strength, right? Which I think Edmond, that's the one maybe knock on him. Um, and certainly right now, we don't really get a feel for what his arm strength could be after an offseason of of working on it because he's been injured. And so that's kind of not to his benefit either is as you sort of kind of have to work through that, you're wanting to prove yourself in the new position and and cement yourself with even better qualities, being able to work on the things that were maybe weaknesses last year. You're dealing with this wrist thing and you're not really able to have that sort of offseason where he's working on arm strength. So I would say Victor Scott, the upside that I think is there. And I think the the base foundation level defense is already there. I think he can play a major league caliber center field and can do it well. And I guess the risk in it would be, yeah, do you worry about his confidence getting shook if it doesn't go well offensively? But the comparison that I would make just from that specific standpoint is that Mason Wynn hit 170 last year and nobody's worried about his confidence right now. I'm not saying that is a perfect comparison, but I do think it's somewhat relevant because I see the psyches and the mindsets of these two players to be rather similar. I think there's a range of outcomes for both of them as to what could happen this season. Talking about Mason Wynn and Victor Scott, if you put both of them on the open day roster, they're probably batting batting eighth and ninth in your lineup on a given day. But two guys with bright, bright futures that could potentially be guys you would, within two, three years, you see them as top of the order types of players. Or maybe middle of the order types of players in the case of, of Mason Wynn if he develops some power. Could Victor Scott develop some power? It's it's not really been his game. Um, the comparison you'd want to make is is Michael Harris, who didn't have a, a lot of uh, re- results to show for his power in the minors, and then he comes to the big leagues with the Braves and just takes off and never looks back. Um, that's almost like a, a a perfect world edition of what you'd see from Victor Scott. But then there are also things that, you know, what were the changes Michael Harris was working on before he got to the big leagues and then the the results that he was able to put together when he arrived for Atlanta a couple of years ago, um, whenever that was, were those the results of the changes that he'd already made? Um, again, that was just com- conversation kind of back and forth with, with Kyle Reese on Twitter, which is great stuff. I think Victor Scott is in a spot where he may not be that that guy who suddenly – develops a ton of power, although he did hit uh, seven home runs last year, I believe, in his minor league stint in AA Springfield. I'll pull up the numbers right now just so I have it accurate for you guys. Uh, Yeah, he started last season in high A and was not much of a home run hitter, but then when he got promoted, he ends up hitting seven home runs in about the exact same number of games and plate appearances that he had in, in, in A ball, in high A. 308 PAs in high A, 310 in double A, only two homers in the lower level, but then seven when he comes up. So are there are there changes that he's working through to be able to um, just continue to hit the ball with more authority, I think is what he's been been trying to do. And the, the stolen bases really didn't lose a, a tick either. 50 in A ball and then uh, 44 in the same number of games in double A. So that tallied up to 94 for the season. Look, if, I mean, if you take the seven home runs and you double it, which is not exactly a, a fair thing to do necessarily, especially because when he comes to St. Louis, he's going to be batting toward the bottom of the order. You would have to think rather than at the top because they've got guys like Donovan, they've got guys like when Newt Bar returns that they'd like to have in that early portion to kind of be table setters. Uh, but certainly Victor Scott's skill set lends itself to eventually being a leadoff type of guy. 
especially if he's drawing walks, which was, uh, you know, a solid thing that he was able to do last season in the minors, 46 walks. Yeah, you could probably see that get raised a little bit more, but still a pretty uh, a pretty solid start and only 97 strikeouts in 618 plate appearances. But we're talking about identifying and looking over these numbers from high A and double A. We do have to acknowledge there's going to be a pretty significant jump, but he also doesn't need to, like we don't need to project that Victor Scott II can be an 850 OPS or an 800 OPS when he walks into the big leagues. Mason Wynn walked into the big leagues and OPS for something and we're cool with it because we think, yeah, he's the type of player that's going to learn from that experience. He's going to have found that cup of coffee plus. It's like a it's like a little stint, little run that he had for six weeks. He's going to find a lot of utility from that and have learned a lot from that to be able to then come out and be a solid contributor offensively for the Cardinals this year would be the hope. His spring numbers are fine. Um, 227 on the batting average, but Mason Wynn has shown a little bit of power with three doubles, and so he's got a little bit of a better slugging percentage of 364 and uh, has taken some walks to get him to a 370 on base. So three, uh, a 734 is Mason Wynn's OPS. You would slam that if you could lock that in for his 2024 OPS. That would be stupendously good. Right? I mean, he's going to bat lower in the lineup and solidify shortstop defense. That's what Mason Wynn is about. And then there's like the room to breathe, the helium, the upside to have him turn into a really productive hitter at the bottom of your lineup. And then in future years, work his way toward a more prominent role in that batting order. That's sort of the the whole impetus behind Mason Wynn at shortstop. I view Victor Scott almost a, a very similar way, right? If his OPS is 700, he's held his own. Tommy Edmonds OPS for his career is, is just north of 700, right? Dylan Carlson is a little bit above 700 for his career. And last year, I think both guys were a little bit lower than their career norms, but those were the guys that we were talking about. So like, do you want to look at them as the models and say, that's all Victor Scott can be. So time to call him up because we think he's ready to do that right now. Or do you say you want to protect a guy a little bit longer, make sure his skills are caught up to what the results we're seeing on the, on the baseball reference page would suggest before you give him that leap. But you could also do it like there are numerous examples throughout baseball over the course of history where teams do it the other way. And maybe you let Victor Scott play almost the whole season in triple a like Mason Wynn did last year. And then he comes up toward the end for that cup of coffee. And maybe he still struggles or maybe he's great. Reality is we're not really going to know until it happens, but all we can do is make our most educated guess on these players on when's the right time. And it's, I don't think there is a perfect answer. If anyone says, yes, definitively, this is the right time. They're probably wrong. And I recognize that I say definitively, this is the right time for Victor Scott. Um, but because, you know, I've, I've said, I think the Cardinals, if they're serious, they're going to put them on the opening day roster. I do think there is a blend to be had between what is optimal for a player's development. We think, because we don't really always know, but what do we think is optimal versus like what kind of fits with the organizational plan? And for me, I think there's enough overlap with knowing that the Cardinals need to be valuing wins in 2024, knowing that there is a short-term and long-term opening potentially in center field, because for as much as Tommy Edmond could be a really good center fielder, there are attributes that people would say, well, the arm, does that hold him back from really being a gold glove caliber center fielder? And offensively, are you straining every day to put his bat in the lineup for 162 games against right-handed pitching when he's been much more solid against left-handed pitching? Like, I think there is absolutely room for Victor Scott to come in and sort of supersede what our, our baseline expectations would be of Tommy Edmond, not to say he's not a good player, but I think Victor Scott could bring a lot to the table and force the issue on that. And I'm inclined to let him, yes, because of where the Cardinals are this season, knowing that, look, you could start out with Dylan Carlson and Michael Ciani kind of taking these opportunities and you could end up seeing what that looks like. But is there a higher degree of risk to me uh, against the tough April schedule of going, you know, 13 and 17. And then suddenly you're like, shoot, we're, we're back in a similar position that we were last year. And we're in a hole that, you know, last year we weren't able to dig out of it. It's not that simplistic of a thought process where it's like, Oh, 2024, you've got to win. So do it at all costs. But I think it blends with where I believe Victor Scott's development to be. So that's why I would have him on the team. People will disagree. I'm okay with that. Reasonable minds can do so. But I've laid out my my thought process where I think he's advanced enough. I think 
the 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 way he analyzes the game and has that sort of analytical background and understands the, the that he has to have that hunger to learn and and uh, improve and grow at the big league level to really be able to thrive. I think he's going to be doing that with the scouting reports. He's going to be studying pitchers' tendencies to be able to to steal that extra base and to to gain that extra millisecond on his jump. I think he's the kind of player that's going to be able to implement that and not have the moment be too big for him. It's a gut feeling, but I'm I'm comfortable with the way I look at this, particularly if we see the rest of spring unfold and Victor Scott II doesn't fall off a cliff, right? If he falls off a cliff and he starts striking out a bunch, then maybe you have to look at it a little bit differently. You have to look at it the way that John Mozeliak last week said when asked about Victor Scott potentially making the open day roster, he said, we maybe want to be a little more patient with that. Right, He doesn't want to add fuel to this fire, understandably so, because if he says anything that sounds like, yeah, we're going to do that or we're thinking about that, then the backlash if they don't do it is more significant than it already would have been. But let me tell you, this is something that they're thinking about. You don't put the lineup together the way that they're putting it together right now if you don't want to get every possible look at Victor Scott. He's leading off every time he's in the lineup, it seems. He's playing center field when Dylan Carlson who could slide into that back into that fourth outfield utility outfield type of role and platoon with Burleson and left is playing left field today. We'll see what Victor Scott looks like. By the time you listen to this podcast, you'll probably already have seen his outcome on Wednesday. And so of course we will get to that in a future episode of the podcast because it will be really, he's the, he's the most interesting guy to track at this point in camp. But yesterday the Cardinals tweeted out the Victor Scott, the second experience bunt single steal second score from second on a single. Like, that's the kind of thing that he can bring to this Cardinal team. You liked Whitey Ball. Well, guess what? Like, Victor Scott II is that type of player. He's got the the ability to invoke some of that sort of flair and vibe to this Cardinal team. And I also don't think, you know, vibes are useless at this point. We we talked all last year about how the vibes were bad. Good vibes can, can help turn things in the other direction. And I don't think it's smoke and mirrors with Victor Scott. Like, if you thought it was just kind of a... Uh, a fake batting line. Like, is he going to OPS 900? No, not in the big leagues. Not yet. If he is, we're talking about, you know, a guy that you signed to a 10 year extension immediately, but I don't expect that. But do I think Victor Scott could hold his own, learn as he goes, learn why in some at bats, he's going to be overmatched and then adjust to it the next time against certain pitchers and find his way while OPSing 700 or so being about league average offensively, maybe a, a touch below but solidifying center field in the way that Tommy Edmond would have done and also potentially, rather than holding back his development, jump-starting his development to see him get his feet wet at the big league level. And then if he does flounder, if the OPS kind of looks like what Mason Wins did last year in his opportunity, rather than say, we're going to push it and continue, we're going to say, oh, good, Lars Newbar's back, and now we can, or, or, or Tommy Edmond's back, and now we can, right, they can find ways to adjust down the road. I don't think it has to be permanent. The Cardinals want it to be, though. If When they bring up a guy like Victor Scott, they want it to be permanent. But you know what? They thought the same with Jordan Walker last year, and they did send him down, and he came back up, and nobody died. Like, it's okay. Like, everything is just going to happen the way that it happens, and we don't have to be overly cautious to say, oh, man, if they bring him up, it could ruin him for the rest of his career. I guess, but like it could also go the other direction. And I don't think that we really know. There's no way to ever know. You could have the most polished prospect and think he's ready, and then that guy becomes a bust versus somebody that that makes the changes behind the scenes to be able to ready himself for the opportunity, and he comes out and he can hang. Um, I don't know what Victor Scott's numbers would be if you put him in, in the big leagues right now, but I think he could hang, and I, I think, too, you're going to get the benefit of it, even if he struggles. Even if he struggles and then has to go back down to Memphis, that could time itself out pretty much finely with the way a Lars Nupar or a Tommy Eben or both could return to the lineup. You don't make the move planning for that, but I do think that's the the fail-safe kind of fallback option. In a perfect world, he comes up and he hangs and... He, you know, unfortunately for Tommy Edman, turns Tommy Edman back into a utility player because you can't send Victor Scott down if he's performing well and you're trying to win games in 2024. So the Cardinals have talked a lot about needing to to rethink how they do certain things and do things differently as a result of last season. And I'm not saying that that specifically applies, that logic applies to this decision, 
I think it should. I am advocating for that it will, provided Victor Scott continues to hang, right, in, in the rest of spring training, which is my anticipation. It's what I think he'll do. I could That could end up not being the case, and we could have a different conversation, but we got to operate with what we know right now. Right now, he looks like a guy who could hang. I know he can stabilize center field defense in a way that Tommy Edmond would have. I believe he brings a spark to the team that, you know, Michael Ciani could bring that spark. I don't anticipate it necessarily to the same degree that I would with Victor Scott because people would be excited uh, to see him, and I think that that would carry value, would carry a little bit of helium for the clubhouse. I, I think it could make a lot of sense. And the Cardinals, despite what you might be seeing, some people on Twitter don't know what they're talking about. Some people do. The people that say that Moselak has definitively declared that he won't be on the team are wrong. The quote's not out there. If it is, show it to me, and I will correct myself. But people that are tweeting at me and saying, Mo said it's not going to happen, so stop talking about it. You're wrong. He didn't. He said the the quote that they're going to point to is him saying, we probably want to be more patient on that, or whatever the specific. And I guess if you want to find the exact quote, that would be beneficial to everybody. But it's the quote that he said about patience. I'm pulling it up here on John Denton's feed because I know he tweeted the quote. On Victor Scott's chances to make the roster with the injuries they're dealing with, quote, I think we have to be a little more patient with that. Clearly, he's opened up some eyes early on, but we have three weeks of camp left. So there's a lot of time to still make judgments and decisions, and we'll see how things go. End quote. That's not John Mozeliak saying Victor Scott's not making the team. People are losing their minds because they have no media literacy, and I'm giving too much attention to it on the podcast. But that's what the, the situation is. That was March 8th. All right, so five days ago, according to when I'm recording this, Victor Scott's getting a ton of runs since then, and he'll continue to. There's a reason for that. They want to be patient. They have no reason to say, yeah, we think he should go win the job, because why would you? I mean, you just wouldn't say that. That would not be very good messaging. Be patient. We got time. Let's see what he does. Ollie Marmel has said, we want to see more of him. We want to see him. Read between the lines, people. Victor Scott's got a chance to make this team. I don't know if it's a great chance. I don't know what what he needs to continue to do. Like, if he if he continues going three for three every day like he did yesterday, he's on the team, I promise you. Bet my life on it. But I, I also recognize that there's going to be some days where he goes over. But in those days, Cardinals fans will see, oh, he went over. Ali Marmel, John Mozeliak, they'll be seeing different things. They'll be seeing, all right, how did he handle it? How did he handle it defensively? Did he carry his at bat into the field when he struck out? These are things that matter when you think about bringing up a guy and committing to him for the journey of 162 games where the team is going to really need everybody to be all in and, and try and get this the ship righted after what happened last year. So those are kind of my, my base level thoughts on Victor Scott. A lot more to come because we're going to see uh, more information from him as he continues to play, even Wednesdays, starting in center field, leading off for the Cardinals. Talk more about that. Talk more about Sonny Gray and the other Cardinals injuries and any other topics that seem relevant as we approach the regular season Opening day on March 28th. Appreciate you guys, though, as always, for listening. Make sure to hit that subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen and subscribe. Please do follow on Spotify. Be Shafe Daily. Just hit the follow button. Helps me a lot to have uh, more numbers on multiple platforms. So if you guys like the content, please go to Spotify. Be Shafe Daily. B-S-C-H-A-E-F-F Daily. Type that in and hit the follow button. Leave a nice review if you enjoy the podcast. That'll do it, though, for this edition of the show. Thank you guys so much for listening. And we'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace.